Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity to present the findings of our work. Um, it's great to have the opportunity and particularly to reach all the online um, people who we hope are watching. Um, <coughs> so, first of all, as Wendy said, this work was carried out with um, a team of Sudanese colleagues. So you've had some of the names who are up on the screen. And then we also had some local researchers that we worked with across Darfur. And I think most important to say, we could not have done this work without the hours, days, weeks, months of, of time that they put into it. It was absolutely essential in their insights. Uh, what I'm going to cover um, <coughs> this afternoon is I'm going to give a little bit of context to the study, a little bit of background to the study. Um, I'm going to summarise some of the findings. This is the report that I'm talking about, and there's an awful lot in it, so I'm going to have to be quite selective in terms of what I cover. And then I'll talk a little bit about the implications and opportunities that we've identified as a result of doing this work. I'm not going to talk about the methodology, just because of lack of time. But if anyone is interested in the methodology, I'm very happy to come back to that um, in the question session afterwards. And on this um, slide, you'll see a photograph of the cattle market in Niala, uh, where we spent many hours talking to traders, interviewing traders. And actually, as some of you know, earlier this year, that, that livestock market, that cattle market, was attacked in Niala. Um, but we were doing the field work between February 2011 and February 2012, over a 12-month period. So why is the livestock trade so significant? Um, <coughs> again, there's many Sudan experts in this audience, so a lot of this will be very familiar to you. But um, livestock is, of course, Sudan's third most important export after petroleum and gold. And even though we only have estimates, um, the estimates indicate that Darfur accounts for probably somewhere between a quarter and a third of Sudan's livestock resources since the secession of South Sudan. Livestock are a key component of almost all rural livelihoods in Darfur to a greater or lesser extent. And when we talk about trade, we often talk about it being the lifeblood of Darfur's economy. If you cut off that trade, the economy will die and livelihoods will die. So trade is absolutely essential to Darfur's economy and to livelihoods at the household level. Um, and that's both long distance trade. So Darfur has a very, very long tradition of trading across thousands of, of kilometers with Libya, Chad, West Africa, but also within Darfur between livelihood groups. And in that sense, trade is a key point of connection for different ethnic groups and for different livelihood groups. So what I'm presenting is the findings of this in-depth study that we did into the livestock trade, which is part of a much um, broader program of work that Tufts has been supporting on markets in Darfur. And uh, Tufts has been supporting the national NGO, the Darfur Development uh, and Reconstruction Agency, who are carrying out ongoing market monitoring currently in three states, <coughs> North, West and Central Darfur. And there's some copies of their bulletins um, here and outside. These have been produced on a quarterly basis um, and available on the Tufts website. And then Tufts is also leading these in-depth studies, so the livestock one which I'm presenting today, and we're right in the middle of, of a, a second study looking at cash crops. Um, and both of these studies are really exploring well, what's happened during the last decade of conflict. How has trade been impacted? What does that tell us about what's happening at the, um, at the household level? And what opportunities are there for supporting livelihoods through trade? And we think this is making a key contribution in filling a kind of information or knowledge gap. So by understanding trade dynamics, you can get some real insights into conflict dynamics, who is trading with who, 
which areas can some groups pass through and which areas can they not pass through. It also helps us to understand the impact on livelihoods through trade. And in a contracting economy, we've been able to identify some areas of potential economic opportunity. And I'm going to highlight a couple of those in this presentation. And although it's a secondary objective, we've also been able to provide some early warning of deteriorating food insecurity, particularly through the, the market monitoring that DARA is doing. Um, so map of Darfur, familiar to everybody. Um, but I think the thing to point out here is Darfur's four international borders with South Sudan, Central African Republic, Chad, and Libya. So cross-border trade has been very important um, in the livestock sector. Although, again, I, I'm happy to talk about that maybe in the discussion time. Just through lack of time, I probably won't dwell on it very much now, except to say that Darfur has been affected by instability in those, and political instability in those neighboring countries, particularly Libya and Egypt. So let me say something about the constraints to um, Sudan's livestock trade at the national level. Um, Sudan is very dependent on an ex its export trade with a very small number of export markets. It's highly dependent on Saudi Arabia and Egypt, which means it's very vulnerable to trade bans, policy changes in those two countries in particular. And we've seen that happening twice already in, in the early 2000s with Saudi Arabia. The globalization of trade regimes um, means that the regulations for welfare, hygiene, disease control have become increasingly strict. And Sudan is really struggling to meet those with its existing um, veterinary services and physical infrastructure especially when it's competing with new suppliers like Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, um, it hasn't been able to maintain its competitiveness in the livestock export market. And then many livestock production areas are very far from Khartoum, Darfur being the classic example. So livestock attract on the hoof. In the rainy season, that may make sense because they can be grazed along the route, but in the dry season, it means that livestock are losing a lot of um, their, um, their quality and are, are arriving in, in poor condition in Omdurman, and having been trekked over sometimes a thousand kilometres or more. So let me move on now to how the conflict has impacted on Darfur's livestock trade. And Early on, again, I think familiar to many people in this room, was the very extensive looting of livestock in the early years of the conflict, which meant that livestock became a liability for many households. And many households sold their animals as distress sales. Prices fell. A uh, number of animals on the market increased um, dramatically, particularly in 2003, 2004. <clears throat> but also during this period, Many livestock traders left the business. Either they became bankrupt if livestock herds were, if they lost their entire livestock herd as they trekked from one market to another. Um, but also, livestock trading was seen as a very risky venture, um, has been, still is a very risky venture during the conflict years. So some traders have chosen to switch to trade in less risky um, commodities, whether it's cash crops or, or even manufactured goods. So one of the findings of this study was the reduced number of livestock traders, as well as, an, as a greater ethnic concentration of livestock traders in Darfur. And the large-scale traders from Omdurman withdrew from Darfur early in the conflict. And in many ways, that meant that it was the Darfuri traders who had to carry the risk of trekking the animals from Darfur, from the areas of production, to Omdurman, that main ter major terminal market. It's very difficult with the data available to know exactly how, how much <coughs> the livestock trade contracted. But based on anecdotal information from the livestock traders, many, many livestock traders that we talked to, we've come up with this estimate that the livestock trade contracted by something like 40 to 50 percent, especially in the, in the early years of the, of the conflict. 
And trade has also reported the deteriorating quality of animals being brought to the market. Now, that appears to be partly because they've had limited access to uh, grazing areas that they would have used pre-conflict, and also some groups that would have been associated with fattening animals, for example, camels, um, before they came to the market, are now displaced. And so that part of the market chain has, has um, dropped out. And then there's been a massive increase in trading costs, and I'll, I'll give you some evidence of that in just a minute. So how has the market network changed and adapted? And I think the entrepreneurialism and the flexibility of Darfuri traders is certainly well known across Darfur. Um, but what we've seen is constantly shifting trading activity according to which areas are more secure and less secure. So um, whilst many primary rural markets in Darfur closed early on in the conflict, some secondary markets declined in importance and others became more important if they were in more secure areas. So for example, the camel trade in North Darfur pretty much shifted from Malit to Serifumra, and this photograph on the slide is actually of the camel market in Serifumla about a year ago. <coughs> um, livestock traders have also needed um, more capital as livestock prices have risen and, and as trading costs have risen. Um, and let me just show you some of the other adaptations that they've, they've made. So, the trade routes that traders are now, having, are now using have had to change. So, for example, before <coughs> traders taking cattle from Janaina in the west to Omdurman would have taken the most direct route, which took about 45 to 60 days. Now, during the conflict years, it can take up to four months for the cattle to reach Omdurman because of the much more circuitous routes they're taking to avoid more insecure areas. They've also made adaptations like reducing the number of animals moving in one herd um, and, of course, having to employ armed guards. And you can see the consequence of this in terms of the rising trading costs. Now, I don't know how well you can read those pie graphs, uh, those pie charts at the bottom of that slide, but the pie chart on the right, um, which shows the trading costs of taking cattle from Janaina to Omdurman in 2011, almost a quarter of the costs were spent on informal fees. So that's basically fees paid at checkpoints to try and guarantee safe passage of the cattle through different parts of Darfur. And almost another quarter of those costs was, the, was paying armed guards to protect the herds. So you can see how the direct consequence of the conflict has really escalated trading costs and we've documented many, many um, examples of the difference in trading costs between 2002 and 2011, and they've risen anywhere between 100 to 900 percent. Um, and I should also mention the soaring formal taxes. So, for example, <coughs> in Niala, there was many instances of formal taxes having gone up by as much as 300 percent during the conflict years, as the state and locality authorities are trying to gather revenue from a contracting economy. Um, so formal taxes have also increased massively. Um, let me say something about the economic opportunities that we identified, um, because to our surprise, in some ways, we did identify economic, uh, we did identify emerging opportunities during the conflict years. And the first is the emerging meat industry within Darfur. So this is very much a consequence of the very rapid, albeit distorted, process of urbanisation that's taken place in Darfur during the conflict years. So many livestock producers have now become consumers in the IDP camps, and of course you've got this huge international presence. So meat prices in Darfur, on many occasions they match cartoon prices for meat. They've gone up 400 or 500% during the conflict years. But... Darfur has only one abattoir and in Niala, and that one only functions intermittently. Um, the trade in hides and skins was another economic opportunity that seems to have developed during the conflict years. 
um, especially to West Africa, and there's some very interesting <coughs> links to the uh, particularly Amis peacekeeping troops, um, who were, which were in Darfur in the early years of the conflict, who seem to have facilitated that trade. Um, but rapidly rising prices in the last five years. So this, is, again, seems to be an interesting uh, and emerging economic opportunity. Um, we've also come across some examples, which I won't go into now, but we can talk about during the discussion, if anyone's interested, of how certain ethnic groups that have been hostile to each other during the conflict have actually made agreements in order to maintain particularly the long distance trade of livestock from Darfur. So there's some very interesting examples of Arab and Zagawa groups um, making agreements to maintain the um, export trade in camels from North Darfur to Libya, for example. And we've suggested that this could be the foundation for future peace building work, work that need, would need to be done incredibly sensitively, but that we think there is some potential. So let me finish off with a few. We make a number of recommendations, and I'm only going to pick out a few of them um, uh, right now, um, because we've come up with recommendations for immediate action at a policy level and at a federal level. Because of the increase in capital that livestock traders now require to stay in the market, um, we're suggesting that a pilot credit scheme should be um, uh, should be attempted in some of Darfur's main livestock markets. We're suggesting that market infrastructure should be improved and there should be an investment in market infrastructure, particularly where trading activity has moved from one market to another, which is not particularly well set up to deal with um, larger numbers of livestock. And we're also recommending that a feasibility study be carried out for expanding the leather industry in Darfur, building on this growing um, trade in, in hides and skins. At a strategic or policy level, uh, we recommend that a strategy should be formulated for developing the meat industry in Darfur, both to meet the growing domestic demand and the export trade. And developing Darfur's abattoir capacity is, is a very obvious um, need in, in this respect, even though there are attempts to expand Darfur's abattoir capacities, uh, progress is extremely slow. And then finally, at the federal level, um, I'm just picking out two recommendations here. First of all, we feel there's a real need to review and revise the taxation policies as they're hitting the, the livestock trade, because now that the uh, taxation has been decentralised, if you like, to the locality level, um, the amount of taxes that are being applied um, have, has increased exponentially. And there seems to be a need for some kind of dialogue between the federal and the state and the locality <coughs> level to see how taxation could be streamlined to, to not just maintain, but actually improve the competitiveness of Sudan's livestock trade. And then finally, um, since the abolition of the Livestock and Meat Marketing Corporation in 1992, and by the way, many livestock traders still lament that, uh, uh, that decision, but responsibility for livestock marketing is now scattered across a number of different federal institutions. <coughs> and so one of our recommendations is that that institutional responsibility should be streamlined at the federal level so that there could be much clearer um, and much more consistent and coherent um, policies and strategies for promoting the livestock trade. So let me finish there. Um, that is the website where you, or the web link, where you will see all the work that we've been producing on trade and markets in Darfur. Um, and there are a few copies of this report um, if people want to pick it up at the end. Thank you very much, Margie. Um, that's an, an interesting summary of how the conflict has affected the, the livestock markets in Darfur and in Sudan, but also the opportunities that have arisen in some cases as a result. Um, I, I should have said at the beginning that if you do have your phones with you, and hopefully they're at least they're on silent, but you can tweet about the event, and the hashtag is Livestock Sudan. 
Um, and I also wanted to say that Margie's written an article for us together with her, her colleagues, which is in the latest issue of the Humanitarian Exchange. And this article is called Understanding Trade and Markets in a Protracted Conflict, the Case of Darfur. So I urge you to, to read that. Okay, well, let's move on now. 